to uh, do his presentation on simply simplify your game and training for better results. Take it away, Martin. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, hey, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Hope you're not going stir crazy and uh, or getting carpal tunnel syndrome from playing too many video games. Um, so, so let's say, uh, uh, Jeff, can you keep it next slide, please? So it's obviously about simplifying your game and actually just go to the next slide. Uh, so I'm making certain assumptions here uh, with the with the the group that I'm talking to is that you're you're reasonable squash players. You've got access to good information. Uh, you do have some kind of general programmer routine that keeps you fit and strong. And there's no obvious areas that you know you're you're not 40 pounds overweight. You know you're not eating McDonald's all the time, or and uh, you've got a good attitude. You you know there's there's it's not. I'm not going to, you know, there's there's obvious things that your coach or, or your parents or you will know just uh, that you need to improve. So that's not what this is about. This is about little tricks, little hacks that that will be able to hopefully help you simplify your game and, and make training more efficient, better. And uh, so and like all of these kind of things, um, you know, if it's not clear, I'm, it's not this is not an exhaustive list. Um, you know, it is about simplifying. It's about, it's about like a few key pieces of information. If you need clarification on that, feel free to unmute and talk, or as Jeff said, uh, write your question. Either is fine for me. Uh, I certainly don't mind explaining. Uh, so that's that's really what uh, what, what this is about. Next slide, uh, Jeff. I suppose the the other thing that I, that I forgot to mention is that you uh, the fact that you're on this webinar means that you want to improve and that you think you can improve. You've got a growth mindset, and that is obviously incredibly important to improving. So we're going to focus on four areas, uh, pretty basic, physical, technical, mental, tactical. Physical is uh, pretty, is bigger, it's, it's a bigger, uh, the bigger list. Uh, there's a few little things in there because of the mechanics of the game and, and um, the way you move on the court, that's, that's, that, that's a bigger list, but uh, certainly, certainly, hopefully it'll be still pretty simple. Uh, next slide. So, I mean, obviously, you'll have trainers, uh, or you'll have access to trainers, or or coaches that tell you, or or you can, online you can get information on on how best to train. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of my experience. I have uh, I, I I studied a long time ago physiology and sports science. I've kept up a little bit with um, uh, with some of the advances in in training, and uh, but my experience also uh, was that. Training is uh, by what you're really doing when you train is that you're slightly damaging your body. Yeah, you're you're just you're overloading your body in some way, uh, so that that your body is forced to adapt. And in that in and part of that process, there's a preparation phase. There's the, the obviously there's the hard work, uh, and then there's the rest, the relaxation, the sleep, the nutrition, uh, and doing everything that you can to get prepared for that next effort. Um, so while you will, you'll have maintenance sessions, you know, whether that's in the gym, on a bike, running, uh, whether it's just, you know, doing routines, playing games, there, there will be maintenance sessions that, that you will do that will be part of what you're doing. But in terms of training, uh, in terms of actually making sort of slightly damage in your body and then recovering, really what you're looking for per week is like two or three focus sessions of around about 20, 30 minutes. Uh, and that's what allows you to get that, that uh, training effect. So it doesn't seem like a lot. So, um, so I remember about 25, 30 years ago, there was a guy called Chris Boardman, who I think he was the mile, it was the cyclist, he was the mile pursuit uh, guy, won an Olympic gold medal, world record, all that kind of stuff. And he, he only trained three times a week for 20 minutes. Now, it would take him a lot of time to prepare for that, but really his focused effort where he, was, where he had his training effect were in these three 20 minute sessions. So what I'm trying to tell you is that if you're looking for, if you're looking to actually make a difference physically, this is what you're going to try and do. If you do lots and lots of work, if you're training uh, 30 hours a week, and but you're you're not really overloading your system, you're not going to get a training effect. Uh, what you're going to so whereas if you if you manage to knit into your training these three or two to three uh, really hard sessions, uh, then you will get that effect. You'll become stronger, fitter, faster, or whatever you're trying to train. Um, so. Everything else, like I'm assuming that there's other sessions beyond that, right? There, so there's other maintenance sessions. So for that 20, 30 minutes, really what you're trying to do, you do need to warm up for this. You need to get your body ready. And that's not just warming up and breathing and getting your heart rate. It's also coordination. It's also just trying to tell your body. You're going from, you know, sitting in a car or a train or, where, where, or walking or 
you know, sitting in a classroom and, you know, you're trying, then you're going to be running around the court doing unusual movements. Like you need to, you need to tell your body that this is what's going to happen. So you need to ramp up to that. You need to build up to that. So, and also in that process of warming up, you're, you're getting yourself mentally ready as well. So while again, while you're this training effect is only, it's only, you know, a, a few times a week for a short amount of time, you, you do need to prepare very, very, uh, very specifically for it. Um, and, and what I found, uh, and I think what, what pretty much most of the top players find, and, and just logically, what uh, the best training for squash is ghosting, it's core movement. Because really what that does is that, that you'll probably work harder in ghosting than you're going to work in a match. It's probably going to be tougher, or you can make it tougher on a squash court than you are going to be working hard in routines or games or matches. And, um, and also what you're going to try and do is that, you know, if you're biking or in a gym or, or something like that, you're, you're doing movements that are not necessarily going to translate to, to being a squash player. So ghosting or court movement, that's the activity that transfers all of this other stuff into what you're trying to do. That's what allows you, you know, so you build up the, some of these skills, you, you become stronger, faster, fitter, uh, but ghosting is the thing that translates to everything. So really, so what I'm saying is that if you can do like a couple of good ghosting sessions a week for 20, 30 minutes, that's what's gonna allow you to be a better squash player. So next one, Jeff. So another important thing as well, I, I kind of alluded to it, as uh, on the on the last page is that when you so you activate when you're activating uh, when you're warming up you're looking to activate the muscles that are going to be that you want to use more so if you're warming up for a game or and you're just warming up on a bike and then you run on and you 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 know play a squash match that like you're not using that you're you're training you're activating the muscles to be a cyclist you're not activating the muscles to be a squash player so yes, you can warm up in a bike and get your heart rate going and kind of get your blood flowing, uh, but you still need to go on and then do a little bit of core movement, or you need to do some exercises that recruit, let's say your glutes, for example, uh, that, that you want to use, you want to use more uh, than other muscles. If you just isolate everything in your quads, for example, then those are the muscles that you're probably going to favor. So be smart about how about your warm up. Be smart about before you go on, going on to uh, to uh, to play a match. Is that activate the muscles you want to use? Um, so, and the ability to and in terms of ghosting, in terms of core movement, it's the ability to lunge, control your movement, and then recoil back out of that position. Uh, eventually, if that is not good, if you're fall, if you're too high into the ball, if you're too um, uh, too close to the ball, uh, you're, you're, you're running, you're not quite stopping, uh, you, that's going to be the bottleneck. You're always going to be cross court and out of pressure, you're, you're, your opponent's going to read it, and eventually that's going to be the thing that stops you. You might get away with it for a while, well, you're a good junior and you're quicker or you're faster or stronger than your opponents, but after a while as you progress, that's the thing that's going to be the, that's going to be the bottleneck in your game. So working on, working on your lunges is one of the most important things for court movement. So and there's three types of lunges that I've listed here. Uh, and I don't know if I want to go through absolutely everything in detailed fashion here, but because you can have access to this software, so you're going to have this PowerPoint uh, that Jeff will send you. Um, but I'll, I'll go through as much as I can. Um, but you're looking for, there's, let's say there's three different types of lunges. I mean, there's probably more, but those are the three main, main, main areas. Uh, the medium lunge is the thing that you probably, most people will use. You know, that's kind of like this, you know, if you've got dumbbells, you're going to do a lunge. It's like you're, you know, you're kind of, it's 90 degree lunge and uh, you're, you're kind of absorb a lot of that shock with your quads. It's not really a movement that you use in a squash core very much. Uh, and it's actually not that efficient. You, you kind of isolate a lot of that stress in, in your quads and it's not, and it, it's difficult to recoil out of that position as well. So I think that the short lunge and the long lunge are the, the, the most important. Uh, the medium lunge is something you can obviously practice, and it's, but it's not something that's really going to translate. It just makes you a little bit stronger. It's a good moderate uh, strength exercise. Uh, so the short lunge is the, is the one where you, you're trying to catch yourself, all, all your weight on your lower leg. You don't want that strain, that stress traveling up your body. Uh, so if you look at some of the the top players, like a lot of, you know, let's say look at someone like Gregory Gauthier, like he he very very rarely gets uh, gets uh, incredibly low. When he does get low, he does a long lunge. He doesn't really do a medium lunge very often. He'll do this short lunge where he takes everything and his kind of I wouldn't say his calves, but it's just all the muscles in his lower legs. 
Uh, and he just and and that's what allows him to not put his weight into the ball and then to push out very quickly as well. So he will do a lot of exercises, a lot of plyometrics, a lot of ghosting that allows him to move in this way so that he doesn't need to fall into the ball and then push himself out. And uh, so that's 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 the, the incredibly important if you want to be able to move quickly in and out of the ball. And for when the ball's not right in the corner, you're not completely out of position. Uh, the long lunge is the one that's it's the most efficient one. Uh, actually, let's go to uh, no, let me because let me, I think I go over this on the next page. Um, but the long lunge is the most the most efficient one. You spread the strain out on your of, over your body, uh, over the the whole pretty much the whole of your body, your lower back, your glutes, your quads, your calves. You pretty much you spread that strain out and it allows you to stay away from the ball. And if you have the ability, and you and you probably use your big muscles, you probably lose your use your glutes a lot more in that position. If you use your quads to stop your whole body, then you're probably still going to be fairly high. You're probably going to fall over a little bit. You're not going to have that recoil out of the ball. Uh, if you absorb with your glutes, you still have your lower back that falls into the ball. And then there's a natural elasticity with, the, with your lower back. It doesn't want to be, your spine doesn't want to be bent over like that. So naturally there's an elasticity that comes with that. So, so the ability to be able to do the short lunge and the long lunge, not just this medium lunge that everyone will practice, um, that, that's, that, that will help, that will add something to your game. Um, the other thing I've listed here is your wrist and your forearm strength. And again, I think I'll go over this later in the, in the PowerPoint. But that, what that does is it allows you to, to, so you can hit the ball from behind you off your back foot. You can, hit, you can reach forward and you can still have a lot of power with, uh, with your shot. It also allows you to get the racket head very close to the ball, um, which gives you a lot of deception, and then to snap the ball into different areas of the court, while still, even if you decide not to snap it, you still have your racket head is close, so you still have a lot of control. Uh, so building that wrist and forearm strength is something that uh, is very important. I mean, it's, it's something, again, all the top players have. Uh, you, you know, you need to have it. If you're just, it's the, the, you shouldn't think of the swing as being like an arm. It's not your arm swinging. It's actually, it's all about the racket head controlling the ball. And having and sending the sending the ball to the area of the court that you want, hopefully with the the kind of power that you want as well. Uh, so if you think of it in that way rather than a swing, then it'll and then the wrist and the forearm strength becomes a very important uh, part of the game. Uh, next slide, Jeff. So I kind of go over I go over uh, uh, just to, how to build some of some of these things. I think some of these some of these uh, you can actually do it right now. I mean I don't know how. But there's obviously these people for in different situations. Some people have houses, some people have apartments, some people have gardens, uh, some people maybe there's a sidewalk. Uh, but you can practice these kind of lunges, uh, with, you know, in different areas. So, you know, so in terms of in terms of most of most things that you're trying to build, you know, going like doing low low impact stuff, moderate impact and high impact. Uh, that's how you're going to progressively build the ability and progressively train yourself. Uh, so the low impact stuff for the short lunge will be anything that allow anything that has got footwork, anything that allows you to be able to sort of stay fairly high, and you use your feet and you use your lower legs to change direction and move around. So whether that's ladder, doing some ladder stuff, whether it's soccer, tennis, uh, even throwing and catching. Uh, you see someone like Roger or Federer. Uh, when he's doing, when he's training, a lot of the time it's uh, it's footwork. A lot of the time it's uh, just his trainer throwing balls, you know, just slightly uncomfortable positions, and then he's got to kind of move his body or slightly lunge, uh, not not a long lunge, but a slight lunge, uh, and then to kind of catch the ball, but be very very stable, be incredibly stable with his with his lower legs, uh, and then skipping things like this as well. That that obviously helps. Uh, the moderate stuff is kind of ghosting on a court, just right regular ghosting, but you stay, try to stay upright, catching your weight on your lower leg. Don't, don't try to lunge over too much or, or to try to recruit too much of your quads and your glutes when, you, when you're lunging. Um, and so, and that'll help, again, that'll help build that kind of uh, strength and, and the coordination and, and the technique of it absorbing everything in your lower leg. Uh, the high impact stuff, it's, uh, I don't want to tell you too much about that, I just want to allude to it because uh, any, any high impact activity that you do, you should, you should consult a trainer, you should, should consult your coach uh, because there is a risk of injury. Um, but, you're, but a couple of things that you can do, and I wouldn't recommend this without talking to a, to a professional about this, uh, but if you're, if you're on a step, uh, you can jump off and land. Uh, so that's something that, the, let's say, triple jumpers or sprinters will do. They'll, they'll land 
Uh, they'll actually jump even off garages, the roofs and things. <laughs> they'll jump from, from a high, uh, from quite a high height. And, uh, and they'll land in two feet. But if you, if you want to land in one foot, you can jump from like, you know, a foot or two and you can land in one foot and you want to try and absorb that shock in, in, your, in your foot. Again, it's, there's a, there is a risk of injury and um, you've got to be very careful. Um, and any kind of plyometrics where you're kind of jumping and landing. So plyometrics is when you're, you can even do it just off a kind of like a step height. Uh, where you're kind of jumping up and down just and uh, with either two feet or two feet you can do two steps one foot you can do one step and um, anything that allows you to kind of absorb shock and then push off as well uh, that's going to help you that's going to help your movement massively uh, so as i say be very careful about this that's uh, certainly consult a trainer and a coach before doing this kind of stuff uh, but some of this stuff you can do right now i'm sure i'm sure you can find an area where you can do this um next slide jeff Uh, long lunges, uh, they, so I haven't, I haven't put in medium lunges because everyone kind of knows that's pretty much what everyone, everyone does. Um, and that's certainly what your coach and, and everyone can, and everyone involved in squash can tell you. Uh, the long lunge is a little bit harder because it's, um, because you're naturally going to want to catch yourself with your, with your kind of quad muscles. Uh, but it's, so, so that's one of the reasons that you want to, when you're warming up, you want to activate your glutes if you can, because that allows you the, the confidence to be able to lunge out and still feel like you can catch yourself. You don't want to stop your weight too early or not get too low. Uh, so by activating these and building the strength, uh, you feel very comfortable just to be very relaxed, but then you can throw yourself at the ball, lunge, catch, be balanced, play a shot and, and recoil. And um, so the... So again, low impact, medium impact, uh, high impact. I'm not going to go through all of this right now because you can you can read it. Maybe if you want to ask questions on it, that's fine. But you can you can read this stuff. Um, but it's basically the same kind of thing. But you're you're just trying to you know low impact. You're kind of light. Uh, medium impact is kind of uh, it's, it's obviously a little bit more high impact. It's the the kind of faster ghosting where you're really throwing yourself around the court. Uh, the the wrist and the forearm strength uh, that's something I just sent off for some grip strengtheners from Amazon just to, just just to, it's just a, a nice exercise if you can't play squash you're gonna you're gonna atrophy in some way some of your muscles in this situation are gonna atrophy that's just there's only so much you can do at home and so some of the squash muscles are, are gonna atrophy one of the ways you can mitigate against this is by strengthening your forearm and your uh, and your wrist so these kind of grip strengtheners it's not not perfect but it's forearm and the wrist figure of eight and and it's not so much about just getting the ball in the perfect position. That would that's easy. You just use your body and your arm. But when the ball moves, you snap that wrist, get it off. That's those are the movements that actually help. like. So instead of your racket head, you need to be able to use your forearm and snap that wrist to get that acceleration of the racket head to keep that ball in that corner. Uh, it's quite hard to do. You need a lot of coordination. Uh, you need a bit of practice to do this, but you definitely. But you're not going to do it if you just use your arm. You, you need to have that forearm and wrist strength to to do this. So it's, it's a nice exercise to build up to, um, and it's certainly something that um, I mean, I, pra I used to practice a lot, and a lot, all the players that I coach they, they do this exercise. Uh, next slide, Jeff. So technically. Um, you know, just thinking about the racket more than the more than the movement. Um, I mean, in general, you want to get the racket out. So as you move from the back of the court through to right to the front of the court, in general, you want the racket to be progressively lower and further out in front of you as you move forward. So as you, you know, you'll reach back, let's say, for, through quarter to court, when you're reaching back, you're playing the ball off the back foot before the back wall. Uh, you know, if the ball comes off the back wall, the racket's probably going to be a little bit higher. Uh, when you move to the middle of the court, the racket will probably still be pretty high, but it will be maybe a little bit more out in front of you, trying to anticipate and trying to take that ball slightly early rather than behind you. Um, and then as you move forward, you kind of want to drop that racket and reach out in front. So at least you have the option of the drop shot and hopefully another couple of options from there. Uh, if the racket is too high, when you move forward, it's going to be tough for you to keep the ball in the corner. 
So in in, in general, I mean, it's not it's not uh, it's not a you know perfect bit of advice, but in general, it's good to think like that as you move forward in the court, further out in front and lower. Um, so one thing that does help uh, with with the with technique is this slow, slow, quick technique. Uh, so I see a lot of, and this is actually quite, it's, it's, it makes sense up to a point. Uh, so players, so you know, young kids, so when they hit the ball, they have, they usually use a very high swing. They start their acceleration from very high. Uh, you obviously, the, the earlier you start your acceleration, uh, the less control you're going to have. You might get power, but you can have less control. Uh, so you're always looking for this balance between control and power when you're hitting the ball. And so one thing that helps is this kind of. So you need the early preparation and then so a little bit slower down so you can get your body and your hips and your shoulders and a little bit of your arm coming down and then coming through through the shot a little bit slower as well. So really what you're trying to do is you're getting you've got momentum, you're trying to get the racket head as close to the ball as possible uh, with momentum. So what you can do is you can, you know, at that point just snap your wrist and you can send the ball with power to any part of the court or you can just stop the racket or just like just go through with a uniform speed and you can control the ball in that way uh, so it gives you a lot of options this kind of technique is just and really what it is 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 getting your racket head as close to the ball as possible with a little bit of momentum that allows you both power and control uh, so that's something that you can practice as, as well and you know just practice that technique rather than accelerating from a high swing uh, just think it slow down, slow through, get the rack ahead literally as close to the ball as you possibly can or to like this, an area that a ball might be in if you're going to just swing and ghost it. Uh, but just get, and then that little bit of a snap right at the end. Uh, and again, look at the, look at the top players. Like, they pretty much exclusively use this kind of technique. Um, just sort of, again, getting that balance between control and, uh, and power. Um, so another thing that is quite useful. So that's that's a nice little a nice little bit of information for you. And on the backhand side, uh, so as your as the when the ball comes cross court, whether that's a boast or a cross court drive, uh, rather than kind of have a high racket and either not be able to volley or not be able to take the ball early off the boast, uh, like having the, having the flatten the racket head a little bit and have, having the ability to take that, uh, take that ball out in front of you. It tends to be easier on the forehand side to reach forward on the forehand. On the backhand, it's kind of awkward for people. They don't want to do it uh, because they've got probably an open racket face and they just don't get taught to do this when they're, when they're younger. Uh, but the ability to be able to straighten the arm out in front of themselves with a slightly, a slightly uh, flattened racket head, uh, that will allow you to be able to, let's say the volley, allow you to be able to cut off that cross court before when the angle is still, it's still pretty easy to deal with. Uh, the longer you leave it, the further the angle is going to be, then you're going to have to go back and get the ball off the side wall or back wall. Uh, but if you manage to reach forward with a flat racket, you can kind of punch the ball there. Uh, you're not going to have amazing control, but you'll have enough control uh, to be able to, to play a good shot and it's going to be confusing for your opponent or it's going to be tough for your opponent. Uh, and also with the boast is that when you reach forward and you flatten your racket and you've got it right out in front of you, uh, then you can you can reach forward and you can cut off a boast, cut down the angle before it goes to the side wall. Uh, so that and then that and if you play a drop off that, then it's like you're probably going to win the rally as long as you're reasonably quick to the front. So those are a couple of uh, good little little tips to, with technique. Um, yeah, I suppose the other benefit of that is that it allows you it allows you to prepare with a short swing to cut off a hard shot, and and allows you to keep like keep your position on the tee as well. You you don't have to compromise. You don't have to move off the tee. The longer you can spend on the tee, uh, the better a player you're going to be, the more successful you're going to be. Uh, so this is just another technique that allows you to control control the tee. Your opponent hits probably a half decent shot. You you don't, you don't maybe even just a shut a stuff uh, a kind of shuffle step. You know, punch the ball, half kill. Your opponent has to go and get it. Has to move again around you, or move like in a in a bad position to get the shot, and you're still in control of the tee. So it's a great a great technique to have. Uh, I see some of you guys have it, um, but not everyone, obviously. Uh, next slide. I just had one question on the last page for the sure. technical. Um, so when you say uh, cut the ball on the cross courts and like flatten the racket. It's like, are you gonna? Isn't it like gonna cut too much, or it's like, I mean, like when when you're gonna cut the ball? Well, you're not really cutting the ball, like so. That's what I'm saying. You flatten the racket face, 
So when you flatten the racket face, so, what, so really what you're trying to do is, so so you're the, let's say you're using, you know, you just look at your hand right now. So if you're if you're if you the back of your hand is facing the screen, I mean that's really the position that you want to be in when you're hitting the when you're hitting the ball. You want that racket head to simulate the back of your hand, like that's really what you're that's what you're trying to do. I mean that's essential what the racket face is. The racket face is essentially the palm of your hand, just an, an extension of it. And what you're trying to do, the only way you're going to control that ball. Um, I mean, if you leave the if the ball's not coming so fast, you know, the ball's going to dip a little bit. Maybe you can cut the ball a little bit with a slightly open racket face. But if you're cutting off a hard drive cross court, whether it's from the front or the back, uh, you need to be able to to flatten that racket face to 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 control that ball. If you're open racket face, you're you're going to need to leave it later, carve around it. The ball's going to be further away from you. It's not going to be an easy shot at all. So I'm talking about reaching forward, flattening the racket face, getting that palm of your hands. And getting your knuckles forward and then having the ability to be able to punch that punch that ball. Does that Great. make sense? Yep. Good. Um, so I've listed a couple of little mental mental things here, um, which uh, again it might not be might not be rocket science, might be, uh, but certainly it's it's uh, things that have been very useful to me. I, I know it's uh, obviously in terms of just experience in, in anything, it's, it's useful. Uh, but when you're going through, so if we look at this, you know, 20, 30 minute training time, you're going to do this a couple of times a week, very hard session. Um, you know, you do need this long preparation, you need this, you know, this ability to be able to get your mind, your body, your coordination, everything just ready for this like incredibly intense training time. Uh, so while you're going through that process, focusing on your breathing allows you to uh, just allow it relaxes your body, relaxes your mind. And that's really what you—that's what you want in the warm-up. You—you want to relax your body as much as possible, uh, and then prepare prepare your body for prepare your mind for for what you're going to do next. Um, so I think that's that's something that is you know if you, and if you breathe through your nose, it'll, it may, I mean it's just another way of focusing on your breath. Really, it's just that you have to focus on it, and it's the uh, and focused on on relaxing your abdomen and relax you know relaxing your stomach so that. So that you're not just tight, like you're letting the oxygen flow in and out of you quite easily. Uh, I would say that's an incredibly underestimated part of uh, any kind of physical activity is the ability to be able to re relax your body. Uh, so when you know yoga is quite a big thing these days, it's quite uh, it's quite in fashion. Uh, but really, what what yoga does to you, it just it gives you information on your body, it allows you to get to know your body. You're putting yourself into you know, compromising positions and stretching yourself and you're learning about what you what happens what your body you know the resistance that your body has it doesn't want to go in this position whereas if you progressively breathe relax breathe relax breathe relax then all of a sudden you can train your body to not have that resistance and um and that's really what you're trying to do in this situation as well you're trying to learn about yourself under pressure a little bit and so the more you can, the more you can be aware of your breath, the more you can relax when you're going through quite intense times, uh, then it'll, it'll give you more information. You'll get to know your body better. You get to know your brain better. And then you're going to be able to kind of just slowly release that whatever resistance is there uh, that is stopping you from being a better player. So I would say that's a big thing. It's just something that you can practice in your warm up is to, to focus on your breathing. Uh, I don't, you know, I think you can still wear headphones and listen to music. I think that's OK. Um, but as long as you're focusing on your breathing and you can relax your body and, and then I think it's, uh, it's going to be helpful. Um, another mental trick is, I mean, these are just good, good, good bits of advice. It's not necessarily it's something that any coach can tell you. So I'm, I'm not sure I want to spend too much time on it, but some pretty obvious things like don't, don't waste things, don't waste the energy and things that you can't control. You know, the conditions are going to be the same. I'm assuming I'm talking to mostly juniors here. Um, you know, if you're, if you're wasting energy on, on things that you, you've got no control of, uh, then it's, you're just wasting energy and you're probably, you're focusing on something that's not going to help you. Uh, so and and you're you know first up whether it's a little injury the referee where they don't like the core or you know you had a bad meal or something you can't change any of that stuff and so all you can do is accept it adapt and then try to make the best of the situation uh, and also you know that's the nature of sport the nature of anything is that you know bad luck happens you know you're going to have some bad luck sometimes uh, everyone does uh, you get bad decisions, everyone does. And so rather than focus on those things as negative things, see them as just, okay, that's just the natural part of the process. It's not that, you know, no one, no one has, you know, this happens to everybody. 
and and so you just have to deal with it at this situation so the better you deal with that is that is the the better you'll be so i think that's an important thing i think it's something that's probably it's probably told to you in lots of different areas not just in sport but it's something that you can practice in sport because you're going to be under pressure a lot in sport and you're going to have some bad luck bad luck's going to be obvious and so so the ability to be able to handle this situation uh, and then to try to turn it into a positive and and to accept it turn it into a positive I mean, that's something that you can you can take into every other area of your life and and it's going to help you and so rather than, rather than you know poor me yeah yeah so um sorry i've got an echo here jeff i'm not sure why martin might as well keep going okay okay now it's better now um and another just a, just another little tip about competition. Um, I mean, competition is it's quite an intense it's quite an intense activity going through a competition, and it's uh, it is a little you know it can feel personal sometimes. You know whether that's you know sometimes you might not want to beat a sibling, or sometimes you not you know you you feel as though you can't beat a certain person because their you know their image or you know they're meant to be better than you or or something like this. None of that actually matters. I mean, all the, the competition is okay. There's, you know, maybe for some of you, you want to go to, you either want to go to U.S. college or, or you just want to get into any college or you want to play, or you want to play a little bit more. Maybe some of you want to be pro. Uh, you know, that's, you know, there's a, maybe a slightly different focus in that regard. But for most people, it's like competition is is uh, it's it's um it's a bit of a privilege actually to to be able to sort of get get really good at something. Uh, your opponent has obviously put in a lot of time to get that good at something and you're trying your best against each other and it's a and it's a nice and you're going to be under pressure and you are going to have bad luck and you're going to but it's an opportunity for you to to um to be under pressure and then to and then to to cope with that situation and try to problem solve and try to you know have the right mindset and and eventually overcome a situation and so it's, uh, you know, I wouldn't feel threatened by, by competition. I wouldn't necessarily see it as a threat to your identity, if that's, if that's an important thing to you. I think it is for some people. Uh, it's just competition. It's just a, it's, a, it's a fun thing that is very testing. It's very challenging. Uh, and it's difficult to recreate that situation in everyday life. And so I, I, the way that I look at competition is that I think it's a, I think it's a privilege. I think it's the, the ability to be able to put yourself in a situation where you're tested and you know you whether you play video games or, or whatever you do any kind of you know backgammon chess like you know it's it's the the competition is what makes it fun as well if, if it wasn't if you weren't challenged it wouldn't be any fun uh, so that's anyway, anyway i mean it's probably that's just a uh, kind of a little aside i think it's something that uh, you can certainly talk to your coach your parents teachers about but it's a uh, i personally think the competition if it's viewed in the right way is an incredibly positive thing um the same, same with uh, so when you're in competition, I think it's it's okay to get frustrated. Uh, it's it's naturally when you're trying your best, you train hard at something, you put a lot of time, effort, energy into something, uh, you know, and it's not working out. It's of course you're going to get frustrated. I think the important thing is that you again you just turn it into a positive. Uh, you don't start talking talking down to yourself or other people or anything like that. You try to turn it into a positive. Accept that that is part of the process. And and try to see it as as a challenge, and that it needs to be overcome. Now, whether it's a you know it might just be you that day, you're just feeling negative, and uh, but try to use it as a means of again, okay, you know, turn it around, turn it into something that that is turn your frustration into something that helps you. Um, and then you know, as I said also here, is that don't blame others. You know, it's not the referee's fault, it's not the court's fault, it's not your coach's fault. It's like you know, you have to take accountability. You you have to. It's you on there. I mean, it's this is you against someone else, and so you have to take accountability. The chances are you're going to get a couple of bad decisions at least. Uh, it's not personal. It's uh, the fact is that you just have to take it, and you have to you have to take responsibility for your own situation. It's not anyone else's fault. Everyone's trying their best. Um, and as I said before, pressure is a it's a privilege. Uh, you know, there's it's. Uh, it's uh, you know we manufacture one of the reasons that we play sport and one of the reasons that it exists beyond um, you know outside of our professional arena is that it provides a uh, great value it provides these pressure situations and and puts you and, and it forces you to focus and and to and to, and to bring out your best effort and to maybe even discover something in yourself that you didn't know was there uh, and that's really you know i can think back to you know some matches that i that i came through in my progress as a as a player at junior level and also as a young pro 
and you know you just you don't you know you're completely outplayed you you don't think you can win uh, but you just get your head down and you figure it out and all of a sudden you you come through and or you come through an incredibly tough situation and that gives you the confidence to go to know that okay well you know maybe i'm not out of it maybe when i feel totally outclassed maybe when i feel that it's not my day maybe that's not actually the situation maybe the reason that people are successful is not because they don't feel like that it's because they just get their head down and they just try to problem solve and eventually they, they overcome these situations and that's something that is that is um i would say all top sports people have they've gone through this process as juniors where they've come overcome these little hurdles and self-doubt and it's not that they're necessarily better and in, in, you know they might be better in some ways but they're not just better overall it's just what makes someone better is the ability to be able to you know go through all these all this pressure and then to overcome it uh, and then to get that confidence that okay this is what it is this is actually what this process is it's not just you being better than someone it's actually about fighting and, and and overcoming like these challenges and being frustrated and overcoming that and getting bad luck and overcoming that. That's what it is. Um, next slide, Jeff. So a, little, a couple of little things about uh, tactics that might be able, might help you. It's probably good to talk to your coach about this or to to someone that can help you. Um, I'm certainly able to answer any questions by email uh, or now if you have any questions about this or anything else. Um, so, you know, as you're watching PSA Squash TV and you see all this incredibly attack and play, uh, it looks a lot of fun and uh, it is a lot of fun and it's very hard work. Uh, but it's also, I mean, it's still built on the basis of like of getting your opponent behind you at the back of the court uh, and then exposing space and or exposing a loose shot and having the ability to attack. Uh, that's still the you know while the game changes and and the you know rackets are lighter and players get faster and training methods get better uh, etc uh, the dimensions of the court don't change and the basics of what you're trying to do in the court don't really change uh, so i would say that's it's just good to remind you of that that it's still the, ba the the basic structure of the game doesn't really change that much it might get quicker uh, there might be more uh, you know a different slightly different risk reward ratio uh, as the game progresses, but the basics still remain the same. Um, volley, like volley as much as you can. Volley as much, get used to volley, even if you overdo it for a while, volley, 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 volley. you're trying to volley absolutely everything you can. Uh, obviously you want to be, at some point, you want to be able to, uh, to control your movement, to control your footwork and to be able to volley and play and attack and straight shot. Uh, that's, the, that's the important thing in the volley, but get used to volleying, that's, that's going to help you. Um, Developing shots into the middle of the court. A lot of the time, people think length, 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 or booster drop. Um, and and really, the the, the shots that are uh, not used quite as much, I see at junior level, uh, and uh, even at like college, high college level, the half kill and the fade cross. And what I mean by that is, you know, so the second bounce is going to be landing somewhere in the middle of the court. So the half kill is kind of like it's not quite a kill, it's not quite a drop shot, it's somewhere in between. Uh, so it's basically like a fast, a fast drop. And so the second bounce is going to come, it's going to be low, it's going to die, it's going to stay tight, it's going to die in the middle of the court. The fade cross is just the cross court version of that. That loads the second bounce down towards the middle of the court, cross court. Um, incredibly useful shots, great to practice. Uh, it uh, adds another layer of pressure and it just, it makes, it adds more variables to the game and allows you, and a lot of it, and it's just, a, it's a low risk way of, of winning a rally or putting on pressure. Uh, so I would say those two shots are incredibly useful. Uh, you need to be able to cut underneath the ball to be able to play them well. Uh, there's, there are some technical things that I haven't really gone into here, but it's uh, but again, it's uh, you know look at PSA Sports TV, talk to a coach, like however you do it, um, and then and then try to practice these shots. They're incredibly useful. Um, use height, uh, and so look at. So a lot of the top players use height incredibly well. The very few of them are just hitting the ball through the court all the time. Uh, a lot, and some of them, like Nick Matthew, uh, Jan Jokan used height very well. Um, when Rami uses height very well, I mean Nick Nick Matthews every third, second or third shot is just a, is a high shot, and then he uses that time and space to get forward to look for the volley or to create a loose shot. Um, and it's just not utilized. When I see junior tournaments, it's not utilized that much at all. Uh, all, the, all the players are trying to hit through the court all the time. And if it's not perfect, um, then it's like, then their, their opponents are going to volley it. And even if they get it past their opponent, the ball comes out the back of the court all the time. There's not really any pressure. 
Uh, whereas getting the ball high it gives you that time to get forward, gives you space. Uh, the ball will die. It, it's difficult to volley, and it's and it is not going to jump out of the back of the court as much. So getting used to using height, getting used to use that six foot before, like be, uh, below the, the the top of the line, uh, rather than the front wall, uh, that's going to that's going to be very helpful to you. So I would say using height, so volleying, using height, uh, developing the mid court shots, um, very important things. Um, just a little bit of advice and moving to a new court. Um, oh no, here's the so backhand containment strategy. That's so that. So backhand containment, I don't know if anyone's on here that has been any other webinars that I've done or anything like that, but uh, backhand containment it means that you're able to keep the ball usually on your opponent's backhand side. You're able to get the ball past their volley and you're able to, to uh, just nullify their game or build pressure very slowly from this type of game. Uh, and I think that that's something that uh, every player needs to possess. It might not be the, your favourite style, it might not be the way that you want to play, but you do need to be able to, to use this strategy. Uh, because when you come, out, come, out, come along a, a player that is you know, faster or has better hands than you, can put the ball away more, uh, you're, not going to, you're not going to want to play this open style of game. You want to be able to build, you know, make them play off the wall all the time. Just put them in the corners, put them against the wall, nullify their ability to be able to, to put pressure while you build pressure slowly. Uh, so everyone needs to possess this. Uh, so I can certainly talk more about that, or if, if you need more information, we can get that to you. Um, when you're moving to a new court, um, you know, rather than just want to do boss and drive and you know, hit a couple of lengths, it's like try to figure out the heights and the paces to make the ball die in the second box. So figure out the, you know, once the ball is warm, figure out the ball, like a boss, is the, the second bounce is going to die. Where do you need to hit it for the second bounce to die against the side wall? Where do you need to hit your length? Uh, three different heights and paces. Where do you need to hit your length and what height and what pace do you need to hit it to get the ball to back, die second bounce uh, into the back court? Where do you need to hit the fade cross to get the ball to die second bounce by the side wall? Like, once you figure these things out, then you'll get to know the court a little bit better. And that's going to help you, obviously. Um, when you're so some of you might have things that you do when you uh, when you prepare for a match. It could be quite complicated. There could be a lot of different variables that might work for you. I'm not trying to change, uh, you know, what you do. Uh, at a minimum, there are things that there are a couple of things that are going to help you. Is that when you look at your opponent, it's like how are you going to win one point? Right? What are their weaknesses? Technical, uh, you know, the technical, physical weaknesses are usually the things you're going to try and exploit in one point. So how are you going to win that one point against them? You know, do you need to do backhand containment? Do you need to nullify them, or do they have you know, do they, are they too close to the wall? Are they hit cross court under pressure? Uh, you know, they're not too quick to the front. Like how, like figure out how you're going to win one point. If that's not obvious, um, figure out how you're going to win the match. You know, then, then you're looking at more like the physical thing, the mental thing. It's like, are they not quite fit enough? Are they going to start doubt if you put enough pressure on them? Are they going to start doubting themselves? So even if you don't, you can't, even if you don't think you're, okay, they might be, you know, play one point better than I can, but over the course of a match, can you still get the better of them in some other way, you know, physically, mentally? Um, and so the, if you think of these two things, that covers most of the, the areas that, that you can, that are going to be useful to you when playing a specific opponent. Um, and like, and uh, you know, just a continuation of that is that, you know, everyone has a breaking point. It, is, it doesn't matter, you know, if you, if you don't feel in control, you can't find a strategy that works for you, uh, really, you know, if you keep on getting the ball, don't not letting the bounce twice, keeping the ball within the lines, uh, you know, just get and just keep them that, keep them getting the ball up. Uh, you know, you might find that your opponent breaks down, and and everyone does have a breaking point. I mean, that's the reality of things. It's like no one is infallible in sports. Someone might be very good, but like everyone has a breaking point. I mean, that's that's something that you have to remember. You just have to find it. You just have to find where that is. Uh, so, um, next slide, Jeff. So this is probably the most useful part of this presentation. It's just a little summary of what I've been talking about. Um, you know, just a couple of sessions, uh, two, three, two, three sessions a week uh, that are just going to have that trainer effect. Uh, the preparation is crucial, obviously. Uh, the ghosting is how you're going to transfer uh, all of that stuff uh, onto the court, uh, all of the off-court stuff onto the court. Uh, the long and the short lunges are the most important part of that ghosting. 
Uh, the recoil is incredibly important. I didn't really go into it too much, but in terms of uh, in terms of being able to stay on top of the rally and anticipate the next shot from your opponent, the, the ability to be able to recoil from the shot to anticipate to get ready, get your foot, your feet, your racket, your uh, and get your eyes in the ball, uh, and to be able to anticipate that next shot. That's huge. Um, the rest in the forearm strength uh, that opens up a lot of creativity in deception. The ability to be able to take the ball in front, by the side of you, behind you, both sides. That's it, and still have a lot of options and be very deceptive. Uh, and it also makes you know you got a lot more creativity as as well when you when you build up your wrist and your forearm. Uh, the slow slow quick technique um, is is something you can practice right now. Uh, the reaching forward with a closed face, especially on the backhand side, uh, that's uh, whether it's in the middle or the front, that's that's incredibly important. Uh, and then just a couple of just a, a reminders about uh, you know some tactics and some um, some mental some mental uh, keys. Uh, so so this was this webinar was not meant to re replace any of anything. There's not meant to contradict anything that your coaches are telling you or the information that you're getting somehow from the internet or from watching matches. It's meant to kind of highlight a couple of things that are that are hopefully going to be useful to you that you can focus on maybe now or certainly part of your game as you move forward. So uh, and I think I think that's it, Jeff. I think just. So yeah, so I'll take I'll field any questions, you know, whether now or or by email would be is fine as well. Thank you, um, thank you, Martin. We we'd like to open the floor to questions. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, are we gonna get? Can can you guys send uh, like the PowerPoint that he just did? Yeah, I think like so. That's, that's, that's what you're gonna do, right? right. Yes, uh, I'll be sending out the uh, a copy of the presentation uh, slides this afternoon. Uh, we will at some point attempt to share the actual video. We have recorded the presentation. Uh, the file is just very big, so it's not easily uh, emailed, but we will at some point have that uh, accessible as well. Okay. Any questions from anybody? I think one of the things that I take away from your presentation, Martin, which I think is important for the juniors to remember is we all see success differently in becoming better athletes. And uh, in my opinion, as a coach in a different sport of curling, success comes with uh, with time, hard work and, and patience. And I think for you guys as juniors uh, that I preach to my juniors in my sport of curling is, you know, perseverance, smiling and having fun are always uh, big keys to, to success. Uh, however you see that, whether you want to win a match, win a tournament or, you know, maybe aspire to be a future uh, world champion. Um, you know, it's those types of things that, uh, uh, as Martin said, take responsibility and uh, and have fun at what you're doing. So, um, you know, we hope you're you're taking something out of this presentation that uh, Martin has spoken to. So there's no one no one wants to argue any points I made. <laughs> uh, we have a question here from a WM Martin. What would you say okay. is the most important factor? when playing the most important factor I, I would say i would say you have to enjoy it i would say enjoying it is 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 a, is a huge part of it otherwise why are you doing it if you enjoy it then you're probably going to enjoy practice and you're going to enjoy hitting the ball you're going to mo enjoy moving around you're going to enjoy the competition uh you, there's going to be there's going to be a, a certain a positivity about you I, I would say that's i would say that's probably the most important thing is like if you enjoy doing what you're doing if you enjoy hitting the ball and moving around and competing it's uh it's going to it's going to lead to a lot of good things uh, if you hate it <laughs> it's like well what are you doing like you just, uh, pick another sport it's it's not it's not this is not for you uh, so i would i would say that i would say that's probably the biggest thing yeah Uh, another question, Martin, from uh, Charlie Flavel. Uh, he says, do you think it is better uh, to focus on squash only or play a bunch of sports and focus later? And for example, when? So this is uh, so it's a good question. Uh, there are, yeah, there's, so this is the long-term development uh, plan, long-term development model. That is on the Squash Canada website. I don't want to contradict it. Uh, just off the top of my head, but I would say up until about 13 or 14, 
uh, it makes sense to do a lot of different sports or the sports that you enjoy. Um, so I, I would say that, that that makes sense. Beyond that, once you start getting into more you know, high performance uh, uh, thinking, high performance habits, high performance training, you're, you're doing these intense sessions, uh, I would say it makes sense to focus on the sport that you want to be excel at at that point. Uh, it's going to be difficult to be 17 and to play two sports like at an incredibly high level. Um, but I, I mean, I suppose it is still possible, but that's, that's what the long-term athlete model uh, recommends. Um, I'll need to go take a look at it, but I think it's, it's round about that time. It was round about 13, 14. Uh, so enjoy as many sports as you can up until that time. After that, it kind of makes sense to, you know, maybe you can still play golf and play squash, but if you're playing, if you're playing hockey, soccer, uh, you know, squash and basketball uh, at that time, it's probably likely you're not going to have the time or the energy to be able to devote anything towards one. Uh, you know, can you do two? You know, the jury's out on that. I don't, I'm not, I'm not too sure from my own personal experience. So the long-term athlete uh, model says no. Um, I would say it's probably possible up to a point, but it's uh, but certainly you know up until 14, like you're looking for yeah a lot of variety. Don't try to get your kids into you know into just one sport and focus on it too too early. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of statistics out there in terms of uh, you know getting kids into hockey early and the success uh, relate the, the you know relating success to that. Um, and I think there is obviously you need to get your kids in early and, and you need to start playing sport at a pretty high level early. But by only focusing on one sport, kids tend to burn out, tend to get bored of it. One, they tend to rebel or just get burned out. And if they're if they, they're too intense from too young an age. So enjoy it. Uh, play, uh, you know, all the sports you enjoy. And then once you get to like 13, 14, start thinking about, um, you know, really what sport you want to excel at. Okay, any other uh, last call for questions? And keeping in mind, if anyone has questions uh, that come up after the presentation today, uh, Martin's contact information is on our website, the Squash Canada website, squash.ca, as our high performance director, or you can email info at squash.ca, and we're happy to forward your questions on to Martin uh, as part of uh, our uh, staff at Squash Canada. So I'm gonna assume there's no other questions. So going forward, I, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. We had a wonderful turnout. Um, for those of you that are interested, uh, Martin will be back next week uh, with uh, his second installment of Heath's Hints with uh, US College Tips. That will uh, be next Wednesday at noon for those of you who uh, aspire to uh, uh, go to US colleges and possibly play uh, squash uh, as part of your uh, college experience. So if you have not registered, we encourage you to do so. And uh, otherwise, we thank you for attending today and uh, take care and stay healthy. Thanks, everyone. Good luck.